So yes, yeah, so instead of going for a SMEF that has been covered many times already in the seminar series, I decided to cover like uh, another effective field theory, which is the one of axial like particles. And uh, the talk is going to touch upon the topics that um, I worked on uh, with the people mentioned here. So in these three works, uh, so this is with uh, Jesus Bonilla, Belen Gavela, uh, Veronica Sanz, Oscar Eboli, Concha, Gonzalez Garcia, Jonathan Machado Rodriguez, and Jorge Troponi. And I would like to thank especially in this instance, uh, Jesus Bonilla, because he also helped me out with preparing uh, the slides and checking out some, uh, uh, some of the things. All right, so this is um, an outline of uh, the talk. Uh, I'm going to touch upon different things. So I will start from an introduction of saying what action like particles are, where they're interesting, I will define effective field theory. And then I will first go with a kind of bit more harder um, theory heavy part on the properties of EFT and especially what happens when one um, goes to one loop. Uh, then I will move on to something which is intermediate, so a theory property, but is actually relevant for uh, high energy measurements, which are constraints uh, from perturbative unitarity. And then I will talk about uh, how to test the uh, ALBS at the LAC. I will uh, give sort of a brief guide. So in general, talking about how to produce it out of decay. And then I will focus on one specific kind of, um, of searches, which is uh, for non-resonant uh, signals that were proposed uh, like in the in the recent years. All right, so axon-like particles are defined in general as uh, the pseudo Gaussian bosons that come from the spontaneous breaking of a DSM symmetry. So there is an infinite number of examples. Of course, the main one that gives the name is the Pacheco symmetry that when it's broken produces the, the QCD axion uh, that solves the, the strong uh, CP problem and so on. But one could think also of other things. For instance, if you have a spontaneous breaking of lepton number, you have the so-called Majoron. If you have the spontaneous breaking of a flavor symmetry, you can have the flavon. All of these are Alps. There are also examples in string theory and compositives in many scenarios. In all of them, what you have uh, is some new physics sectors with a number of new resonances, composite or elementary, depending on, on the model. And then this, let's say, lives at a high scale uh, lambda. And this new physics sector has a, a spontaneously broken global symmetry that has some associated pseudo Gaussian bosons. So these are uh, naturally much lighter than, than the whole sector. And these are, um, these are the Alps, essentially. So wherever they come from, it's not uh, relevant for the discussion that we want to have. They all have the same property. So they are neutral. They have spin zero, odd parity. And they have this special characteristic that um, the interactions of the Alps are symmetric under shifts. And this really comes from the pseudo Goldstone nature and serves as a protection uh, for the, the mass. So Alps are naturally the, the lightest remnant of a new physics sector, which means in a way, so just on mass considerations, they are most likely the, the, the best candidate to be discovered first. So you discover an Alp and then you discover the sector that um, that, it, that it generates it essentially. Uh, because there are so many symmetry breakings in the SM models, um, one could also argue that this is really one sort of DSM particle that is much likely to exist in some of the form at least. And in under certain condition, it also makes a good uh, dark matter candidate. So uh, this is really a unique uh, combination of uh, interesting elements, let's say, that make it uh, the biggest motivation to study uh, axion-like particles. Now, the most common uh, way to study them is through an effective field theory that is constructed basically where the heavy sector that the ALP comes from is integrated out of the visible spectrum. And doing that, uh, one has a model independent theory. So it doesn't matter anymore which was the symmetry that generated uh, the ALP. The, the, the FT is always going to have the same structure. Um, there are also different formulations of the effective theory, depending on which degrees of freedom you want to include exactly. The one that I'm going to talk about is the one that is constructed from uh, the standard model fields plus uh, the ALP as an additional degree of freedom, and that it respects all the symmetries of the standard model. So it's completely uh, SU3 cross SU2 cross SU1 gauge invariant. And on top of that, it has uh, the ALP shift symmetry that is characteristic of this particular field. Um, in the specific uh, analysis that I'm going to uh, discuss today, I also, I'm also going to impose uh, 
uh, CP. This is not a requirement. In fact, there was a paper right today on the archive discussing the CP evaluation part. I'm not going to touch upon that um, today. So everything is going to be CP invariant. Um, the power counting of this theory is actually very simple because it turns out that the living order is just dimension five. So you just need one simple uh, scale to put in. And this is uh, called FA traditionally because it's sort of reminiscent of FI, of course. And that's the characteristic scale of, uh, of the ALP. So the Lagrangian looks like this. And so it's, it's rather compact, at least at a leading order. So this is only the dimension five part. Uh, there's a, the ALP kinetic term, there's its mass. There's no scalar potential because that would break um, the shift symmetry. So the, the mass is inserted as an explicit breaking uh, just to give you the mass, but in, in principle, um, so it, there is a distinction that is being made essentially between the, the mass and the rest of the scalar potential. Then you have three operators that give uh, bosonic interactions and they are written down here. So these are the three operators that couple uh, the ALP to uh, the structures that are essentially generated by the chiral anomaly. So they're all um, FF dual. And the coupling to fermions, if you want to write them in a way that is explicitly invariant under the shift symmetry, you have to give uh, a derivative uh, coupling to, um, to the ALP, and then you will have a vector current uh, actually with chiral fields. So there are five of them for the left and right handed fields. So these also have flavor indices. So anytime I will write down um, the CF, it's implicitly meant that this is an N times N uh, symmetric matrix in the flavor space. If one introduced uh, CP phases, this would be a mission. But okay, so this is just a property of the, of the operator that you conjugate this again itself. So it has to be a mission. All right, so the couplings uh, that come out of this Lagrangian are just a few and they're very easy. Uh, one thing that is uh, characteristic is that um, there are only two operators that generate all the couplings to the electric boson. So you have four different interactions that are controlled by only two parameters. So there are two uh, relations between them that I will come back to uh, in a few minutes. And then you have coupling to gluons and coupling to fermions and, and that's it. So you can have the additional ones with four particles just because of the uh, non-abelian gauge groups, but that's, that's, there is nothing else at this order. Coupling to the Higgs arise at dimension six or at dimension seven. So this is a, an, an Higgs coupling to two Alps, and this produces a coupling between one Alp, one Higgs, and one Z boson. So I'm not going to discuss uh, the coupling to the Higgs today, but if you're interested, uh, they were discussed um, very broadly in these two papers, for instance, and also in other papers by the same authors, they really studied a lot the phenomenology uh, of the Halbig's uh, interaction. So this is a very simple theory, uh, but since it is a very uh, EFT theory interested group, I wanted to show you also some parts that are less uh, maybe obvious. So one property that was realized uh, only recently, as far as I know, kind of surprisingly, was that um, actually, not all the operators that I showed you before are independent because you can do uh, field rotations that can relate some of these invariants. In particular, there are different ways you can see this, but one way is that you can say, I can do um, lepton number rotations, one for each of the three uh, lepton families. So this would mean I couple a D mu A to a lepton, car a lepton uh, number current. And this uh, essentially gives a relation between diagonal entries of the leptonic um, operator. So this is the, the purely vector uh, combination, of course, not the axial one. And this is related to a combination of OW and OB. Or I can do a B minus cell rotation, which at this level is completely independent because I'm introducing the B. Because this is not anomalous, uh, this quantity here has to vanish because it's the same as A, D mu, J mu. So this has to vanish. And this corresponds to these other combination of fermionic operators, only the diagonal parts, but the combination of quark and leptons. So basically from these relations, I can remove uh, as many degrees of freedom as fermion family. So let's say three. And from these, I can remove one extra. Uh, if you want to do the counting for the general number of dimensions, the combination that comes out for the total number of independent real parameters, including the bosonic ones, is this horrible formula here. Uh, 
that for one generation, or equivalently, if you impose minimal flavor violation, for instance, boils down to six plus the mass. Or if you have three generations, it becomes 29 plus the mass. And here you have flavor violating entries uh, that, can, that can appear. Now, can you write down uh, nicely a basis that is non-redundant? Eh. <laughs> so the problem is that these relations here that I just showed you basically allow to remove like individual diagonal components from the fermionic operator. So unless you have a flavor symmetry that makes everything nicer, uh, whatever you try to do is going to come out kind of um, ugly. So from the lepton number rotations, you can choose to remove one of the bosonic or a diagonal entry of the fermions plus another two diagonal entries of the fermions. And from the B minus cell, you can remove any diagonal entry of any fermionic operator. So combinations that satisfy these relations necessarily require you to have like one operator that is only half introduced, so like only the off diagonal parts of one operator plus two diagonal entries, but not the third. So they're kind of, I don't know, uh, not pleasant to write down. So for phenomenology, one thing that is done most commonly is that one says, okay, I keep the three bosonic operators in the basis, and then for the fermionic part, I use a notation that is also, also simplifies, let's say, the matching to lower energy. So I use basically a phenomenological parameter for every flavor uh, that I can re-express as this combination of gauge invariant quantities. And then depending on which one I choose to retain in my basis, uh, this one of the two can be zero or whatever I decide to do. So again, the most convenient is basically to use a redundant set of parameters, but keeping in mind that uh, basically four degrees of freedom can be, can be removed. One question that arises when you see all these games is that, wait, are you telling us that you can naturally remove uh, some of the bosonic operators? How many of those could you remove? Like, could you have an ALP that only talks to fermions in some basis? And the answer is uh, no, not with explicitly shift invariant operators. So if you want to trade the bosonic ones for operators that are D mu A and then a, a vector axial fermionic current, you cannot do this. Uh, and in particular, you cannot do this for the gluon combination and for the photon-photon combination because the gluon and the photon have uh, purely vector coupling. So they can only be canceled off with an anomalous current and none of the currents that enters these operators is, uh, is really anomalous anymore at this point. Uh, another way of seeing it is that to some extent, up to the ambiguity that I was mentioning before, uh, there are two of them at least explicitly break the, the shift symmetry while the fermionic operators don't. So it makes sense that you cannot trade all of them for, for fermionic ones. The game changes a little bit if you decide instead of looking for explicitly shift invariant operators to look at chirality flip operators. So stuff that looks like the Yukawa coupling multiplied by an ALP. And these are also much used uh, in, in the literature sometimes. And the story is that these are not shift invariants. So at first sight, you would say, you know, this is not an ALP operator because it does not respect the shift symmetry. But through the equations of motion on the standard model fields, they are related to the shift invariant ones and the anomaly ones. So you have, you can draw this sort of, uh, of relations essentially. So this is the simplest one for right-handed leptons, but you, you have also the other four for the other um, fermionic fields. So using this sort of structure, you can see that essentially all the shift invariant operators that you have, you could have rewritten in terms of uh, these Yukawa structures, but you cannot do the opposite. Uh, you can only do the opposite if the Wilson coefficients of these chirality uh, flipping structures have this form that is written here. So basically if they can be expressed as combination of Yukawas and symmetric matrices. And this is kind of tautological in the sense because these symmetric matrices are exactly um, the correspondent of the Wilson coefficient of the completely shift invariant operators because these are symmetric operators. So their coefficients have to be symmetric. So if you want to establish a correspondence between the coefficients of these three objects necessarily, you have to identify the symmetric structure with the the, the Wilson coefficient of the symmetric operator, let's say. So in this way, if you write it down uh, with this formula, it's basically obvious that if you write down this basis instead of the other one, but with Wilson coefficients that respect the structure, then you have exactly the same number of degrees of freedom as in the initial basis, the explicitly shift invariant one that, that we wrote down. The whole point is that um, if you 
decide to introduce these operators. At this point, you can decide to remove completely all uh, the bosonic operators. So you can have an ALP that only talks to fermions and not directly to, to bosons, at least as a basis choice. Um, but then you must retain both these structures here and the shift invariant ones. So there is, <laughs> you basically have to make both um, like pseudoscalar couplings and vector axial couplings. And if this sounds kind of uh, confusing, one way that can help to understand it is that this is basically the same exact mechanism that you have um, when you look at a strong CP problem and the chiral anomaly uh, playing a role in there. And you see that you can have the, the, the theta parameter in the GG dual interaction could be completely transferred to an invert to the, the imaginary part of a quarks mass plus uh, the axial current. And this is exactly the same mechanism. So you could remove the GG dual operator, but then you need to introduce something that gives sort of an imaginary part to the masses of the fermions and the, the axial current. Uh, part. All right, so I think I have um, talked enough about these complications of the theory. The main message was that this is a very simple EFT when you look at it, but then because you have anomalies and because you have this shift symmetry that plays kind of a funky role, uh, there are also some complications that are hidden in there uh, and that can be not, uh, not so obvious to, to carry forward, but I think this is understood quite well at this, at this, at this level by, by now. All right, now looking at this Lagrangian from a more uh, phenomenological point of view, I want to go through another aspect of, uh, of the theory. So the point to me of uh, doing alpha phenomenology is that it's extremely interesting because it's extremely rich. And it's extremely rich because you want to describe any sort of possible um, Goldstone boson that could come from anywhere, any scale, any sort of symmetry. So basically, all masses are allowed and all uh, sizes of the couplings are allowed. Uh, this is a plot, for instance, of the photon coupling that I took from uh, Karen O'Hare's um, summary GitHub repository. Uh, and it's just here to show the number of orders of magnitude that you have on both axes and know that this is not even exhaustive because this is not even rich enough to one GD. And also to show how many different sorts of um, constraints and experiments you can have that contribute to, um, to the phenomenology and to constrain in this sort of particles. Now, in a scenario like this, uh, if you're a theorist, one thing that comes to mind is, well, loop corrections are going to be relevant, right, inside these sort of scenarios, at least like running through scales uh, and also finite corrections. Like if I put uh, one coupling inside the loop and I generate another one, then I should be able to still put constraints because I'm dealing with many sorts of experiments that can be arbitrarily precise. So motivated by this um, idea last year, together with uh, Jesus Belen and Veronica, we worked out um, essentially a complete calculation of all the one loop corrections to the two and three uh, point functions. To simplify our lives a little bit for the three point functions, we decided to put uh, the standard model particles, external ones, on shell while we left the, the ALP uh, allowed to have any sort of uh, off shell momentum. Um, so, with this assumption, basically, these are results that are ready to use. Uh, for any sort of uh, scattering, so any process for which the three-point function exhausts essentially the, the Feynman diagram, or for processes where you kind of have a two to one to two um, behavior, so you produce the ALP on shell and then you decay it with, again, on shell particles. For these processes, basically, uh, this calculation already gives you the, the final result and it's completely tabulated and ready to use. If you want to have more complex processes with like two to three or something, um, more complex, then of, of course you, you need to have extra diagrams, but this is at least a, a partial result. So this is the set of all the possible diagrams that we um, consider for the three-point functions, just to say we really uh, were very careful, we normalized everything, even re normalized uh, the, the standard model in part, and worked out all these results. So I'm not going to show you ugly formulas, I'm just going to tell you two things. Uh, one is that um, we cross-check the, the RG evolution results that were derived already just a few months before in these two papers here. So this was covered at length already in, in Sophie's seminar. So sorry, maybe I forgot to say it, but it's okay. You already had two other seminars in, in this series by Sophie Renner and by Stefania Gori that also cover the same um, effective theory. So some aspects um, you can go and, uh, and check there. The only thing that I want to say is that the highlight of these RG was that the bosonic operators do not renormalize. 
Um, so depend, depending on how you normalize the definition of the operator, in our case, the beta function of the bosonic operators is exactly identical to the beta function of the corresponding uh, standard model um, gauge coupling. If you rescale CG by alpha S times another uh, coupling, then the beta function of this coupling is, is zero equivalently. So in this sense, they do not um, genuinely renormalize. And this is something that has been known for a long time, is very well known because of the periodicity of the theta parameter. It was also checked for the SMEFT operator. So if you replace A with H dagger H, you get the same structures and the same behavior in the SMEFT RG. Uh, the thing that we did that was not done before was to uh, work out all the finite parts and this uh, we did it in full arc gauge to check gauge invariance and if you're interested they are available there is a link here you, that you can uh, click on I will share my slides um, so there is a mathematical notebook where one can just download the full set of uh, expressions and in the paper we wrote them out all uh, explicitly and we also study some specific kinematic limits Again, I'm not going to show any formulas. I'm just going to show a couple of uh, applications. So one toy application is that you can think, for instance, I start with an alp that has only one coupling. Let's say the coupling to the top quark that is not very much constrained because um, it can only be accessed at the LHC. So instead of, um, instead of looking at the top quark by itself, I could do things like putting it in the loop and let it generate interactions to other standard model particles. So I told you before, these results are mostly interested for um, scatterings and for two to one to two processes. So this is one example uh, each, let's say. The first example is that you can have the via this loop here that generates a mixing between the ALP and the Z boson. You basically generate an effective coupling to electrons that you can go and constrain in electron recoil experiments like the matter searches or uh, astrophysical constraints. So in our case, uh, we just took again um, the, the bounds on uh, the axion electron electron couplings that were collected by Karan, and we reinterpreted using our loop formula in terms of the top interactions. And you see here that this reaches up to scales of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 TV for the top coupling, which is Enormous, it kills completely uh, whatever uh, LHC result you could possibly get. Of course, it's a toy example because we assume that only the top interaction is there. Flat directions or uh, other combinations could, could appear in general, but still it's interesting to see how powerful this can be. Uh, the other example is that if one goes to the LHC, uh, just by having tops, one can generate the gluon fusion loop and then go and test uh, the resonant production of ALPS in, in PT bar. So we explore this again, uh, very simply reinterpreting a recent uh, ATLAS measurement. And this is the sort of bound that you can get again on the uh, bound to the top. This is a much wider reach. So it's again one TV, which is okay for the LHC, uh, but still so this is two kind of examples of how this can, uh, can be employed. Um, one very last comment about uh, the, the, the finite parts before I move on to the unitarity bounds. Uh, one of the questions that we had when we approached this uh, giant calculation of uh, calculating all possible loops was what is going to happen to the gauge invariance relations that we have between the electric interactions. I told you at the beginning, we have uh, the four possible uh, couplings to electric uh, gauge bosons, and they are described in terms of only two parameters. So there are two relations among them at three level that are the two that you can see written here. What happens when we go to one loop? Well, it turns out uh, that at one loop, you get corrections on the right-hand side, so you don't have zeros anymore, but you have these delta quantities that are um, absolutely finite, um, and that correspond essentially to uh, the coefficients of these interactions here that, as you see, break both uh, the gauge symmetry and the custodial symmetry. So you can write them down just with the W3 component, essentially. And they mainly stem from uh, triangle diagrams of, of this kind. So as you can imagine, they are dominated by the top quark contribution. So the largest contribution is where you have uh, MT squared. And we have verified that if you go to a limit where you recover the electroweak symmetry uh, in the preserved form, so in the symmetric limit, so you send V to zero, or you evaluate this at external momentum of the ALP that are much lighter than all the masses of the standard model particles, uh, 
then basically it is that our corrections uh, vanish, which for us was a, was a cross check. Uh, but it's also nice to learn that essentially just because you have the electroweak symmetry breaking in the game, you are generating these, um, these corrections that kind of create some sort of shift between the, the gauge invariant relations. And this is something that one has to keep into account uh, if you want to compare uh, constraints on uh, photon photon coupling with constraints on uh, ZZ coupling, for instance, with loop precision. If you want to have a gauge invariant formulation, because we like UFT stuff, uh, it's as if basically the one loop correction was generating finite contribution to operators of this form here. So the first gauge invariant uh, combination that gives you this sort of structure or this sort of structure are these two. So you have to start um, at least at dimension seven or higher in dimension nine or, uh, or higher. So these are finite and they're kind of similar to you know, like the loop contributions to the dipole uh, operators that we have in the standard model that are completely finite. And it makes sense uh, because of course, all the divergences are renormalized uh, order by order in DFT. So if you generate something that is higher dimension, it has to be finite necessarily. So this also um, checks out. All right, so I'm going to move on to the part of um, unitarity bounds, which as I said before is again, in between properties of the theories and properties of the phenomenology of the LAC that uh, I want to get to. Uh, and I'm going to introduce this by uh, giving a very short and very basic recap of uh, the perturbative unitarity condition. So the idea is that whenever you have a two to two scattering, you can uh, decompose the matrix element into partial waves. So the formula that you see here is the classical one that is given for when the external states are either vector bosons or scalars. And the lambdas here um, indicate the elicity. So for vector bosons, you can have longitudinal or transverse polarization. So zero plus or minus one, while for the scalar you only have uh, the zero because you have no spin. Uh, and essentially when you have these matrix elements, you can decompose it down into the sum of partial wave with an angular momentum J so there's a sort of an angular form factor in the middle, there's a rotation matrix involved, and then you have these elements here um, that are the transition matrix element at fixed J between your initial and final state with fixed polarizations or elicities. So the unitary um, is imposed on uh, the absolute value of the T matrix element, and they have to stay smaller than one all the time, and in particular, whenever your center of mass energy is much larger than uh, the sum of the masses of the initial state particle. And note that uh, the formula that, that is written here has one, two, one, one, two, so it's really defined for elastic scattering, so when the initial and final state are, um, are identical. All right, so if you have a violation of unitarity, it means that one or more of these uh, components or basis uh, matrix elements end up being larger than one under some conditions. Um, and how to interpret this, uh, sometimes I, I, I find this court interpretation. So the, the way that is in my mind is that you have that either the theory that you're using to calculate the matrix element is not valid. So in particular, you should introduce some extra dynamical degrees of freedom that restore the unitarity. This is exactly what the Higgs boson does into the vector boson scattering and high energies, for instance. So you have a particle that adds another contribution and brings it back below one. Or uh, that the perturbative expansion is breaking down. So your theory of dynamical degrees of freedom do make sense, but you're entering a non-perturbative regime, so you cannot calculate uh, with three and loops as you usually do. So either way, the matrix element that you have computed is essentially unphysical. So this should ring a bell if you're doing phenomenology with this prediction and you discover that you're in a physical regime, then probably your analysis is not, uh, is not correct. So violation of unitarity happens in any effective theory, and in particular in the LPFT, the story is that these DJs scale like some power of C over F with the uh, square root of S to the numerator, and then you can have some other power of square root of S divided by standard model masses like MW, for instance, as a reference. So basically you can get that this is larger than one if, uh, you are at a fixed uh, Wilson coefficient over F, and then you push square root of S too high, or if you're working at a certain square root of S and you pick a too large value of the, of the Wilson coefficient or too low uh, FA scale, all right? So this is uh, the usual story. Um, so basically from this, you can infer uh, 
constraints on what the Wilson coefficient should be at every fixed uh, square root of s, let's say. Uh, and the way that we uh, extracted this sort of uh, constraints on the theory was to use a technique uh, that actually Oscar and Concha already used in these two previous works they, where they apply this to, to the SMEF, so a much more complex uh, scenario. Um, so we started off by computing basically the partial waves, so the, 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 the matrix elements for all the possible two to two scattering processes in the large square root of S limit. So these are all the classes of processes that we considered everything that is allowed in the theory. And then we constructed uh, these T matrices, so for each uh, J, J equals zero and J equal one mainly, they give the dominant constraints. You can construct a, a matrix of matrix elements that are matrices in the space of final states. So you have that each element is like uh, the, the initial state of definite uh, pair of particles and definite helicity, and you have transitions from one to another, so that defines essentially the, the matrix. And of course, this is block diagonal uh, if you classify the processes by the electric charge and the color contraction, because you, you cannot have any matrix element that uh, sends you from uh, a, in a certain initial state to a final state with a different charge, of course. So basically, you can also section these classifying by, by, by charge and color, and then you get a series of block diagonal matrices. And what you do is that you diagonalize them and you impose the unitarity constraint on the eigenvalue of these matrices. So in this way, it's as if you were applying um, essentially the, the unitarity onto an elastic scattering where the initial and final state are actually a quantum superposition of all the possible two to two processes uh, that are allowed in the theory with the charge, with the color contraction, and with the J. Um, so in this way, the, the unitarity constraint is applied properly, so it is really elastic. But the price that you have to pay is that uh, you sort of have a general constraint that holds overall on the theory, uh, but you cannot really interpret it in terms of one specific uh, processes because the information of the given process completely gets lost into the, the diagonalization. So in the end of the day, what you have for the ALP is that really each of the operators is constrained um, in a different class of processes mainly. So in particular, this operator OW tilde um, is dominantly constrained uh, from the process that is VV to VA um, because this particular operator is the only one that generates four point interaction. So it's the only one for which you can have a scaling that is linear for the Wilson coefficient and scales with the cube of uh, square root of s. So this is really the strongest sort of, um, of unitarity bound that you can have in this theory. Uh, for the other ones, OB and OG, uh, they're mostly constrained in J equals zero transition. So VD to VD or VD to alpha, alp, uh, and they scale like the, the square of the Wilson coefficient. Uh, and the fermionic operator here, we use the chirality flipping ones. Uh, they are dominated basically by the scattering of two uh, fermions that go to an alp, and then you have a standard, you have another vertex that goes uh, uh, to an, an alp, and the, uh, the vector boson. And these also scale linearly with the, with the Wilson coefficient. All in all, when you take the information, you can make a plot like this that gives you the bound as a function of square root of s and uh, f over uh, the Wilson coefficient on the other side, so the scale of new physics. These are all lines because for, for this analysis, essentially, uh, we just took the dominant uh, scaling in terms of uh, square root of s. All of these has the same slope because they all scale like uh, square root of s, and let, apart from um, CW, because I told you before, this has the square root of s cube scaling, so this is much uh, stronger. So there is a warning if you look at this uh, plot. One is that for the fermionic basis, we use not the shift invariant operators, but the chirality flip ones with MFV. So the basis is fine, it's completely um, non redundant, complete, and mappable to shift invariant parts. But uh, there is a, a translation to be done if you want to have the information in terms of the, the stuff that was written at the beginning. And the second comment is that we also added one dimension six operator, which is the one that generates the Higgs to uh, two Alps interaction. And the reason why we did it is because in the calculation of the two to two matrix elements, we often had to go up to order one over F squared. So in order to be consistent, 
uh, we wanted to make sure that we also had this operator inside in order to not miss any um, higher dimensional correction. So the way that you can use this plot is, for instance, say you have um, a measurement that puts a bound on a Wilson coefficient that has to be f over g uh, smaller than something is excluded. So like you're excluding everything that is below the, the red uh, dashed line. Now, if you're putting this uh, bound on the operator OG, well, you should not have used any uh, measurement that had a square root of S above 300 GV, because at that point, uh, for this Wilson coefficient and, and higher values of S, you would have been violating unitarity. Well, if you're doing it for another operator like OB, uh, this is much safer, so you could have used even uh, measurements of square root of s equal to tv even if the bound was at two at one sorry and unitarity would not have um, exploded or or anything um, a more interesting approach which is maybe not our situation but in the future could be is that if you instead measure one of these couplings like imagine you go and you measure uh i have this wilson coefficient that is at one tv for instance one of those then if you also assume perturbativity, because you also have to assume perturbativity, um, the unitarity constraint is basically telling you that if you have a Wilson coefficient CD uh, over FA equal uh, 1 over ATB and perturbativity, then at 5 TV, you must have some sort of new physics, otherwise you violate unitarity. So this square root of S becomes sort of an upper limit to where new physics could be. Uh, and you see that essentially this new physics should be much lower if you measure a gluon coupling of the same size, let's say. Uh, the reverse is that uh, you can decide that you have a measurement at a fixed square root of S, and then you can look which values of the Wilson coefficients are consistent at, at this energy. Now, the warning uh, that I already mentioned before is that uh, because we have done all this uh, diagonalization of the matrix, this square root of S really is. Um, a scale of the theory. So an, an idea of the scale of where the new physics should be, but it cannot be interpreted literally in specific processes. It's not defined precisely up to factors of two. So if you're doing one specific analysis, it's not like you can check exactly um, if the unitarity is respected from this plot. You can check it like more or less. So if you find the unitarity is okay up to 32 TV for the value of the Wilson coefficient that you have, then it's going to be fine. But if you find that you're away by a factor of two, it's not super necessarily uh, informative. So this is a, a disclaimer. All right, so let me come to uh, LHC searches. I'll try to go a little bit quick here. Just wanted to give an overview to then come to the non-resonant part. So the point of doing um, ALPS at the LHC to me is that the LHC basically is the only place where you can get access to couplings to heavy standard model particles at three levels. So you can see an ALP coupling to a W, a Higgs, a TOP, or a Z boson. And it's the only place where you can access heavy ALP. So if you have an ALP that is heavier than, say, tens of GV, at the, at the LHC, you can produce it. While lower energy experiments, you cannot uh, see it. And the phenomenology and the way that you look for it depends on several things, mainly on what is the mass and what is the decay width of the ALP. I drew here a band of, let's say, these are the most natural value in the sense that if you think of this plot in log scale, uh, the decay width is proportional to the mass. So kind of reality is going to stand more or less in this, um, in this band. But um, the measurements that you do can depend on one of the parameters and not the other in principle. So you could have searches, for instance, for an app that is stable. So you look for it as missing energy. And this uh, works for decay widths that are smaller than a certain amount. On the other hand, you can look for a resonant ALP. And for this, it has to be heavy enough for the resonance peak to show up at the uh, energies that you are sensitive to in the LHC experiment. Um, and the, the width has to be large enough for the decay rate to be sufficient, so to pump up the, the, the cross-section essentially of the process, but not too broad, because if it's too broad, then you don't really reconstruct well the resonant shape and you lose sensitivity. In the middle, there is a land of long-lived ALPs, so you can look for displaced vertices or signatures at fire detectors, so this is something that is going to be important for the uh, next runs where some of these uh, fire detectors will be turned on. And then finally, uh, the, the part that I will tell you about later, which is non-resonant uh, phenomena. So these are uh, 
searches that work whenever the mass of the ALP is below a certain threshold and they're fairly independent of um, the decay weight. All right, so super quickly, um, the way you produce the ALP at the LHC is very similar to the Higgs production, except that it can be light enough to be also produced in the decay of the Z boson. Uh, for instance, for the rest, you all, you all have all the main uh, scalar production channels. And you also have all possible sort of decay channels, depending on where the mass is, because the, spect the spectrum is very broad. You have no idea what you're going to have around. Um, so this plot gives you an idea of what would be uh, the minimum decay length of the ALP for a given mass. And assuming um, that all the couplings uh, are maximum a certain number. So here being generous, this value is quite low for being probably the LHC. And this one is more sort of realistic. Um, so you have that for sure if the ALP is um, light, so lighter than uh, one MeV, you have all, uh, sorry, yes, you have only the photon photon um, coupling that is, uh, that is photon photon decay channel that is open. So in this case, you are fairly sure that for ranges of couplings that are interesting phenomenologically, uh, this is going to be um, stable. Um, while well, going forward for higher masses, then you get more and more decay channels. The thing that makes the kink most here is the opening up of all the adionic channels. So basically, this is dominated by photons and this is dominated by uh, gluons without looking at couplings. Like if you treat all the couplings at the same way, that's the one that is going to be picked up the most. Uh, if you add the information that you have on the constraints uh, on these uh, interactions, you see that actually the, the bounds are pushed uh, even farther. So this becomes 10 to the 15 meters, so definitely stable. The bound in between uh, where the decay to electrons and muons is allowed goes to 10 to the 5 with an asterisk because this bound is actually with gaps and holes in it. So it's kind of uh, depending on what you believe. So let's say that uh, essentially if the ALP is below 1 MeV, it's definitely going to be stable. If it's above 200 MeV, assuming that it's stable is restricting the parameter space and in the middle there is sort of a, of a gray zone that depends on what one does with the coupling to electrons. Uh, there is also the specification that in here, whenever you start to turn on the decays to gauge bosons because of gauge invariance and the relations between them, um, you find that at least two of these decay channels must be present at all times. You cannot switch off three of them and remain with only one. You really must have um, at least two of them. And this is a plot that kind of shows the maximum branching ratio that you can reach for each of them, uh, optimizing all the possible uh, couplings for every value of, um, of the mass. So you see, for instance, that once you have uh, a mass that is about 200 GV, you cannot mathematically have a branching ratio to photons that is equal one because for sure you need to have at least uh, Z gamma or gamma gamma or W that come here. All right, this is a very horrible slide just to summarize everything that's been looked at so far. I'm gonna skip it and you can uh, read on your own at a later time. And I'm gonna get uh, here to the part of the neuroresonance signal. So this is a new idea that was proposed to look for ALPS uh, at the LHC. And the original proposal was in this paper here. So the Gavela no Sans Troconet uh, in 2019. Uh, and the idea is the one that is illustrated here. So the fact that if you have um, a heavy final state, so for instance, a, a ZZ, a WW, or a TT bar final state, or even a gamma gamma final state where you're looking only at very high uh, gamma gamma invariant masses, and uh, your ALP is very light, uh, then basically it's too light to be on shell. So it will still mediate the process, uh, but you cannot see the resonance because the mass is below threshold. Uh, and normally, so if a normal particle does that, it, this would basically kill the cross section. But in the case of the ALP, it doesn't because the ALP interactions always scale with the energy. So you have energy dependence in the interactions. You have two of them uh, because you have the production and the decay. Uh, and this compensates essentially for the off shell propagator suppression. So in the end of the day, the cross section of the signal, so this diagram squared, scales like S over FA to the fourth. So it's a cross section that doesn't die off, but once you factor in the PDFs, the signal still has 
uh, a decrease, but a decrease that is much slower than um, the standard model background. So essentially what you have is a signal that is not a peak, uh, but it's something that looks like SMEFT, uh, if you're more familiar with that. So it's really a distortion of the spectrum that you are, um, that you are observing. And the nice thing is that once you say that you are inside this regime, so as long as this is smaller than the mass of the final states, uh, the cross-section is essentially independent of the exact value of the mass and of the decay weight of the particle. So with this technique, you can cover really a lot of uh, parameter space at once. Uh, so this is again um, an example from that paper. So this is the result that they got for the constraint on the ZZ coupling using this technique, for instance. And there is a caveat, which is this process, of course, allows you only to put the constraint on the product of uh, the coupling to gluons and the coupling to whatever is your final state, in this case, GA, ZZ. Uh, the point is that if the uh, gluon coupling is not too small, then you can get competitive bounds on uh, on the coupling to, to Z bosons. Of course, if the coupling of gluons vanishes completely at some point or is very, very suppressed, then this uh, constraint disappears. So from this, we got the idea that maybe we could look at something different um, that does not rely on gluons so much. So we decided to apply this idea essentially to the case of vector boson scattering, which is the process that you see here, where all the squiggles are electroweak bosons. So the whole point of vector boson scattering is that you can have uh, two electroweak bosons in initial state, an intermediate off-shell ALP that can be either off-shell in S-channel or off-shell because it's in P-channel. Uh, and then it decays to two final state bosons that go eventually to, um, to leptons. In this way, you're essentially independent of the gluon interaction. Uh, we verify that if one introduces a gluon interaction, basically you have an extra diagram where you have gluons here in the initial state. Um, but because of how things work out, essentially this can only uh, go in the direction of improving the bound that you get by neglecting it. So it's always adding sort of a positive um, signal quantity. So definitely, if you neglect it, you're being conservative. Um, so we did um, this analysis comparing uh, basically the, the ALP prediction to actual measurements by CMS. Uh, of the five channels that were, say, sort of best measured during round two, so the same sign WW, Z gamma, uh, WZ, W gamma, and uh, ZZ. So for each of them, we simulated uh, the ALP signal with the mud graph, and this is one example of the results that you get. Again, it's non-resonant, so it really looks like something uh, smooth that grows in the last beams of, um, of the distributions. And the characteristic is that uh, this cross-section at the interference level is quadratic in uh, the ALP couplings because you need to create and annihilate the ALP. And uh, in the pure signal, it goes up to the order to the fourth. So if you're used to SMEFT, it's not linear and quadratic, but it's quadratic and quartic. Uh, and this is one example of the, the results that we get. So actually, this is the, uh, the summary. So by doing the analysis, simulating, comparing the distribution running, a statistical analysis uh, compared to actual CMS data, you get uh, an exclusion um, region for each of the BBF channels. Uh, and you can draw it in the space of CW and CB, because at this point, they are the only uh, parameters that play a role. Like they control all the possible that recoupling. So this is really just a two parameter, um, two dimensional parameter space. Uh, and you see that all these uh, couplings have different shapes that are also easy to understand, like uh, same sign WW is a completely straight line because uh, there are only couplings to uh, the W boson that enter, so it's completely different to CB. While on the other hand, something like Z gamma um, does depend on CB, so it does close on uh, the vertical axis uh, direction. In the end of the day, what is dominant in, in our bounds is Z gamma precisely because of the fact that it has the highest dependence on CB. Uh, and the uh, same sign WW in, in this direction here that chops off a bit the, the corners on the limit on, uh, on CW. And the combined is the one that you see here in, uh, in purple. So the idea is that we really derive uh, the constraints in this full cage invariant parameter space. And then uh, from here, we can extract the constraints on the individual coupling. So for instance, on the coupling to photons by projecting along the direction. So for instance, the dotted line here is where the 
the photon coupling vanishes. So if you take the, the purple blob and you project it like an orthogonal to the dotted line, you basically get the results for the photon-photon um, coupling or for the ZZ or whatever you, you're interested in. We also looked at projections for the future LHC runs. So uh, what you see here in blue is again the same curve as before for reference. So this is the observed limit. Uh, for the one in green is the projection of the exclusion limit for the uh, run three, so 300 events friend to burn. And the orange one is the one for the high Lumi LHC. So you see that this moves significantly, not really a lot. And the reason is because uh, the cross section scales like the quartic coupling. So as long as the sensitivity drops below one, um, large improvements in the cross section translate into not so large improvements in the Wilson coefficient. So here, the information that you don't have is that the sensitivity of the cross-section is actually improving by a factor of five to eight from run two to the IDOMI LHC. But then this translates only in an improvement of 1 1.5, 1 1.7 uh, on the Wilson coefficients. Still, um, there is margin for, for discovery. So one interesting curve that we uh, that we drew is the dotted, sorry, the, the dashed uh, orange that you see here. That is the discovery limit, let's say, for uh, the high Lumi LHC. What it means is that um, if you, at the high Lumi LHC you measure a signal and the signal uh, corresponds to values of the Wilson coefficients that are outside of this curve, then you have a chance to exclude the standard model by at least five sigma uh, with the full um, high Lumi data set, let's say. So the fact that this is inside all the other curves means sort of even if at run three you don't see anything, there is the margin, so the little space between these two lines for still having a discovery at the LSC, even if you don't have any evidence up to run. Uh, this is a quick check of the independence on the alt mass and decay width. Uh, I think the concept is uh, quite simple. The interesting part that I'm going to highlight since uh, this is an audience very used to EFT, so taking the limit of an energy that is much lower than the mass. Um, the interesting thing is that here we're exactly taking the opposite limit. So we're taking the limit of where the energy that flows through the alt propagator is much larger than the alt mass. And we obtain similar results so that basically uh, there's a set of details that become irrelevant to the prediction of the cross section, which is the exact value of the mass, the exact value of the decay width. The only thing that matters is really the momentum that, um, that flows. So it's sort of the same principle as DFT, but applied in the reverse um, direction. Um, and so from diagrams like this, basically, we can conclude that our results are sort of valid up to 100 GD, so they can be extrapolated up to, up to that. Uh, and I'm going to close in the last five minutes uh, with a comparison of what we get from this sort of analysis, so non resonant BBF, uh, compared to other results that are available in the literature. So to give you the main message in one line is that the main value of uh, doing non resonant searches in BBF is that you can put very strong bounds on the couplings to Z bosons and W bosons, uh, especially in the, the mass region between 0.1 and 100 GV, so 100 MeV, 100 GV, where there is nothing else at the moment, at least not that we could um, find. So this is the WW example. And you see that here you have all the constraints that come from rare meson decays that Stefania talked about also in, uh, uh, in our talk. Uh, but beyond uh, the GV region, there isn't much until you get to like tribosome. So this is where the ALP really decays into WW. Uh, so this allows you to cover this, um, this region here. The other values is that this is uh, independent of CG in the sense that if you turn on CG, the bound can even improve, but at least the bound up to here is completely guaranteed and it's not going to move uh, if you introduce a couple of gluons. And it's also independent of the, the mass. So this extends indefinitely down uh, to the left. All right, so one very final consideration before I get to my uh, conclusion. So one thing that we learn in doing this exercise of comparing uh, our results to bounds that are already available in the literature um, was that, so th there, there is a, um, a problem. So in the, the richness, let's say, of the phenomenology of ALPS really leads to situations where it can be kind of difficult to compare uh, different constraints, and so one has to be careful with uh, many things. So the, the, the thing that is done most commonly 
is to show this sort of 2D plots where you have the alt mass on one axis and the one coupling on the other axis. But then, uh, because one is reducing all this physics down to two dimensions, uh, there is a set of assumptions that are potentially conflicting between uh, one constraint that is shown and another constraint that is shown that is not easy to see uh, in the uh, in the plot. So to me, coming also from this math community, this kind of calls for a sort of more global approach. So try to have parameterizations that are really more multidimensional and try to have uh, a global fit somehow or like a global analysis of uh, of these bounds or sort of a multidimensional um, representation. So in the example that uh, I'm showing here is the classical one of the coupling to, uh, to photons. So there are the different colors that highlight the different assumptions. So those that are in, in red, they are genuine in the sense that the process that is, that is used really relies only on the existence of, of photons and doesn't depend on anything else. But then uh, those that are in blue here, so these are the LHC that come from resonant uh, diphoton or triphoton production, these assume gluon dominance so that you have a coupling to gluons that is actually much larger than the one to photons. Those that are in orange that come from light by light scattering in lead lead collisions, uh, they assume that a branch fraction to photons is equal one. And in this mass region, this means that you don't have a coupling to gluons. Otherwise, the, you would have other decays of the Alps and you don't have couplings to uh, electrons or quarks or any, anything else that could uh, modify the branching fraction. Something similar happened at LEP, uh, where you have that the branching fraction to photons has to be one in order to have this specific uh, interpretation. So in this mass region, this is implying that the coupling to electrons has to be uh, small enough. And finally, so the thing that I mentioned before, like the non-resonant gluon fusion constraint, is in gluon fusion. So this scales with the coupling to gluons. It means that if that the coupling to gluons vanishes, this line disappears completely. Or if the coupling to gluon is larger than whatever was taken to show in this figure, then the bound can even come lower. So all this uh, is a great complexity that is hidden for a, a non-expert person that sort of calls for a change of uh, approach maybe or to, to have new ideas to, to address this. Uh, these scenarios. All right, so I've come to the end and I'm going to leave you here with uh, my wrap-up uh, slide because I talked about really uh, many things, so I thought I would just put the slide uh, summarizing all the main um, messages. And since I'm right on time, I'm going to leave it here. And uh, thank you very much for, for the attention. I'm going to take your questions. <laughs>